dear students, faculty, staff, and members of the community, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today our first ALS Invited Faculty of the Year, Dr. Laura Logan. Dr. Logan is a native of Nebraska and returned home to teach sociology at Hastings College in 2013 after completing her field work in Chicago and other Midwestern communities. Dr. Logan completed her bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Nebraska at Kearney and a master's and PhD in sociology from Kansas State University. Prior to becoming an academic, she worked in the field of social services, primarily in the areas of violence prevention and intervention and strengths-based team-oriented advocacy for children and families in the mental health system. Dr. Logan's research is focused on issues of social justice and inequalities, criminology, gender and intersectionality, social movements, and violence against marginalized people. Her work has not only been published in mainstream academic journals, such as Sociology Compass and Gender and Society, but has also attracted national attention by prestigious mediums, such as the New York Times and the Washington Post. I know I'm not alone when I state that we feel very fortunate to have Dr. Logan in our HC community. Her passion and energy for teaching, learning, and activism are easy to depict as soon as you meet her. Even though here for only three years, her impact has been greatly felt by her students, her colleagues, and staff alike. She serves in various committees and working groups, contributing to campus academic life. This year, she's teaching and advising an INT section. Students, are you INT students? All right. Um, in the years she has been. Um, um, in the years she has been here, she has taken leadership to mentor and advise various groups on campus, such as Radical Notion, HC Alliance, as well as Kappa Rho Sorority. Dr. Logan is a member of Women and Gender Studies Committee and taught the yearly capstone for the minor last spring. She also serves in the Excelsior and Student Development Funds Grant Committee. In 2014, Dr. Logan was recognized with the Polished Apple Award for teaching excellence here at Hastings College. Students, if you have not taken a class from Dr. Logan yet, I highly recommend her, and you will see in about 45 minutes what I mean. Dr. Logan proudly serves on the board of Stop Street Harassment and is an active member of Sociologists for Women in Society. She's also an active reviewer for multiple sociology and criminology peer-reviewed journals. In addition to her academic and professional accomplishments, Dr. Logan is a proud mom of two children, Rachel and Erin, and the most hip and fun grandma to her six adorable grandchildren, Abel, Kayla, Marley, Colton, Stella, and Katie. I could go on forever talking about this amazing woman that I have the privilege to work with and be energized by on a daily basis, but I'm too eager to hear her speak and I cannot wait for all of you to hear her speak. So without further ado, please help me welcome my esteemed colleague and dear friend, Dr. Laura Logan. Good morning. Ooh, the sound works very well. I will now not swear. Good to have a plan. Okay, maybe, hang on, there we go. Um, first, what an amazing introduction. I'm ready to just rest on my laurels now. That was awesome, thank you very much, Ingrid. Thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to faculty and students for uh, asking me to be one of the invited faculty lecturers this year. And thanks to my family and friends for listening to me talk about street harassment for almost 10 years, a lot. <laughs> so, let's dive right in. The title of this talk is Street Harassment at Intersections, and I'm using the word intersections, uh, it's a play on words. So we all know what an intersection is, correct? Streets come together, 
That's what an intersection is. But that's not all it is. In uh, liberal arts education, all of you should encounter this term at some point, and I would argue multiple points, while you're here at Hastings College. It is certainly used in philosophy, in women's studies, in sociology, political science, etc. So what it also refers to is the ways in which our social identities and social structured systems overlap and work together to shape our social world, to shape our experiences in the social world. So for instance, when I walked in here today, as you heard from Ingrid, I am the hippest grandma that ever lived. Um, <clears throat> although Dr. Thompson is arguing with me on this point. Um, I, I didn't leave my grandma self out in the parking lot. On the other hand, it's not the most salient part of my identity right now. So it, intersectionality refers to identity and it refers to systems of disadvantage and oppression and privilege and advantage. And it's important that you have sort of a, a beginning understanding of this term. Also, a quick word about language. I will not be dropping the F-bomb today, uh, and we're all happy about that. But some of my study participants used colorful language to talk about their experiences with street harassment very often when describing what harassers have said to them. So it's important to just give you that little warning. There, there's a little bit of language, but I've bleeped some. Now, what is street harassment? How many of you think you know what street harassment is? Show of hands. How many in this room have experienced something that they think is street harassment? Hands high. Now, the rest of you take a look around. That's a lot of people. This is a pretty common phenomenon. So, uh, street harassment is offensive speech, unwanted speech, unwanted gestures, um, stalking. It, it's a continuum of uh, offensive and unwanted behavior in public space. Often it is sexualized, and depending upon who the target of the harassment is, it can also be racist, homophobic, um, xenophobic in a variety of ways. So, it's important to have an understanding of that as well. The most famous study on street harassment was conducted by Carol Gardner Brooks. I won't detail the whole thing, but what you should know is that she had a very large sample, over 200, and 100% of them had experienced street harassment. In most of the studies, what we see, depending upon the kind of street harassment we're asking about, 60 to 100% of women, in particular, have experienced street harassment, and high percentages of other people who are on the margins. So at this point, I think you probably have a sense that I think this is a social problem. But I'd like you to entertain the idea that it might be a social problem even for those who are not being targeted. I get asked all the time, is street harassment a new thing? Uh, no, it's not. It is receiving more attention in mainstream media than it had uh, prior to around the early 2000s. But it's definitely not a new thing. So as you can see from this photograph, there were, uh, there were discussions in media, in print, about street harassment in the late 1800s and early 1900s in this country. There's, this is the story of a woman who used her hat pin to stab the gentleman who was harassing her. Just took that pin right out of her hat and gave him a jab. Um, and there's some lovely historical work about street harassment from multiple scholars, well, not multiple, a handful. Um, Carrie Seagrave and Estelle Friedman, if you're interested. Uh, there are newspaper stories also about men being arrested for street harassment. Um, this is one where uh, a young man, a youth, harassed at least four or five women and then was apprehended by the police. In addition, there have been social movement action and resistance to street harassment beyond just the individual level, so beyond somebody pulling out a hat pin and saying, I'm going to take care of this myself. Um, some groups, particularly women, have banded together to try to address the issue of street harassment. This group was formed in the 20s, lasted until about the late 30s. They called themselves the Anti-Flirt Club. Now, this coincides, uh, as a sociologist, uh, and anyone with a liberal arts education, you want to think about how 
all sorts of factors influence a social phenomena. So think about what was happening in the 1920s, the rise of personal ownership of vehicles. And one of the things that was happening was that cars being driven by men were like slowing down and harassing women who were walking on the sidewalk. This was not uh, what the women wanted. So there was an anti-flirt club. So harassers have been called multiple things. Uh, inappropriate flirters, skirt chasers, mashers. I like that one, that one's good, masher. Although if you said that now, somebody would think it's Thanksgiving and you're making potatoes. Um, but you can see that we have multiple uh, stories about street harassment long before now. So who does the harassing? In study after study after study, it's men. Uh, men of um, various backgrounds. So we don't see higher percentages of men from one racial group than another or one religious group than another. It's an equal opportunity uh, activity, shall we say. Who experiences street harassment? Well, dominantly it's women or uh, persons who identify as women. But it is other folks as well. And now that people are paying attention to this problem, we're starting to get better data showing who else is experiencing street harassment. So one of the highest risk groups for street harassment are transgender women. This is also the group that receives, uh, that has the highest count of hate crime murder right now. Um, so transgender individuals, lesbian, gay, bisexual individuals are targets of street harassment. Racial and ethnic and religious minorities are targets of street harassment. We saw a very big uptick in the number of incidents of street harassment after 9-11, targeting Middle Eastern or Muslim people, or more precisely, people that the harasser assumed was Middle Eastern or Muslim. Often they got that wrong. And this may be a surprise to some, but probably not to most of the women in the room, girls. Little girls are big targets of street harassment. So we're talking 9, 10, 12. We're talking before puberty and after puberty. So one of the, this, this adorable child in the hard hat here is my oldest grandchild, Kayla. Kayla was walking on the sidewalk long after I had begun researching street harassment. And she lives in a small rural town, and this occurred in that town. She's on a street sidewalk right by her house. Two teenage boys, far older than her, probably 16, 17, walk up behind her because they're also walking on the sidewalk. Rather than walking around her or saying, excuse me, so she can move to the side so they can walk past her, they said, I'm going to use a bad word now, gird your loins. They said, bitch, get off our sidewalk. She's 10 now, she was nine when that happened. She came running back into the house to, to tell what had happened. And I was there at the time. If you can imagine such a thing, I went bolting out of the house to, I was like, not only am I the cool hip grandma, but I am the caped crusader, buddies. <laughs> Where are you at? Uh, but you may not uh, guess this. I'm going to tell you, though. I don't move as fast as a 16-year-old boy. <laughs> so I did not catch them. Um, however, one of the things about that incident that's really striking and that, should, uh, that I kind of appreciate in a twisted analytical sociology way is the transparency of their message. Often street harassment is, uh, looks like flirting. Hey, baby, how you doing? We get a lot of that. Yo, shorty. Yeah? The, the whistle, which I can't whistle. I'd have to go, woohoo. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So often that's what street harassment looks like. But what street harassment's ultimate message is, is you don't belong in this space unless I tell you you belong in this space. And you're kind of an object, so you are sort of like space. I own the space, and I own everything in this space. So if you're going to be in my space, I get to do with you what I wish. So the transparency of their message, get off our sidewalk, very clear. Because every street harassment incident is in some ways 
telling the target, get off my sidewalk, get out of my public space. So every incident is laying claim to space. And in doing so, denying somebody else that space. Others who are targets of street harassment are women who live in urban environments. My research was in suburban, rural, and urban environments. So I can tell you that street harassment occurs in all three of those environments. But women who live in urban environments report more frequent uh, incidents of street harassment. So whereas somebody in a smaller town or smaller community might experience it three times in a year, a woman in an urban environment would not surprise me at all if she's experiencing it three times a week or even three times a day, depending upon where she has to move around in that city. Another group that experiences street harassment are runners and cyclists. This is me with my bike. As you can see, I am quite the cyclist. Uh, I got the bike in August. Have I been harassed yet? Yes, indeedy. And, and typically, uh, when harassment occurs, the harasser doesn't just target one aspect of a person or the perceived aspect of the person, but they'll say, like, fat bitch, which I, always kind of cracks me up because I'm 51 years old. I'm pretty comfortable with who I am. It's not like I'm suddenly surprised that somebody thinks I'm fat. It's an empirical fact. <laughs> I'm pretty okay with that. So I'm always like, gotcha. <laughs> I sort of, sort of imagine they're not the brightest bulb, you know? But whatever. Uh, these two populations are frequently harassed. And then harassment occurs from what we can tell from the data in every country, in every culture. It isn't always called harassment. It isn't always called street harassment. So for instance, in India, it's often called Eve teasing. Um, but it is, it is a problem in multiple cultures. And the global social movement is actually addressing it in multiple cultures as well. Um, and also, different governments respond to this in different ways. So some governments um, try to enforce cultural norms about limiting women's movement in space. Don't go out unless you're with your brother or your husband or your father, period. Or cover yourself if you are in public spaces. Or in Japan, they have women-only train cars to try to prevent the victimization of women from harassers. So we know that harassment occurs in multiple cultures, multiple groups are targeted. It's not just women, but again, it is predominantly women. We know that the harassers are men. But what do they do, and why do they do it? So let's talk about the why first. I'm going to drink some water here. That's my big cup with a big straw. OK, uh, there's two categories of motivated behaviors in connection to street harassment. We can take the men who harass and place them in these two categories. The largest category, somewhere in the 60 to 80% range, depending on the study, is men who are harassing in order to demonstrate their masculinity and bond with their bros. These are, this is, these are the motives. Notice that it has absolutely nothing to do with the target of harassment. In fact, the target of harassment is completely and utterly interchangeable, like a puzzle piece. Just whatever puzzle piece we need for this event. So this is about showing, hey, I'm a man, and this is what a man does, this is what a man can do, and isn't this fun? Aren't we connecting in a manly way, right? The other group, um, which is a smaller group, around 15 to 30%, depending upon the study, is men who are intentionally trying to terrorize their target. And the diversity of targets uh, that I mentioned earlier, where it can be cyclists, runners, women, transgender, lesbian, gay, bisexual individuals, that, that doesn't change depending on the group. So the motivations are for every target. Now, what do they do? They do not uh, do the gesture that Spock does, you know, the Vulcan. However, 
they do use gestures, which is why I have the, yeah, I'm not good with the Spock thing. Uh, but they do use gestures. So let's imagine what kind of gestures. They simulate certain activities. They smack their lips. Um, they make strange noises, kissing sounds, whistles, hoots and hollers, uh, clicking. One woman was telling me about clicking that occurred. She was like, I kept thinking, maybe it's Morse code and I should try to figure this out. <laughs> um, and they also stalk or follow their target. And street harassment incidents can escalate to violence. One of the cases that initially caused me to be interested in street harassment was a, a hate crime committed against a 15-year-old African-American lesbian uh, in New Jersey, Sakia Gunn. Sakia Gunn was on the street with her cousin and friends, and um, uh, two men in a car pulled over, got out of their car, two grown men, these are 15-year-olds, got out of the car and propositioned them. The uh, uh, women said, no, thank you, and said, we're lesbians, so we're not even interested in men. In a way, they were trying to say that to say, hey, it's not you, don't be offended. We're not even interested in dudes. Uh, one of them pulled out a knife, stabbed her in the chest, and killed her right then and there on the sidewalk. And when I read about this case, first I was shocked because I read about it a year after it happened, or almost a year after it happened, and I had never heard of it. It wasn't in the press, it wasn't talked about on CNN, or ABC, or NBC, or MSNBC, or any of those yada, yada, yadas. I didn't see it in the New York Times or the Washington Post. Um, and I thought, now why, why didn't this get media attention? And how is it possible, because I didn't know all the details at first, that a car of men just would pull over, get out, and stab a girl? What was going on there? And then I found out it was street harassment. They were, they were propositioning. They didn't know these women. They pulled over for the explicit purpose of harassing them, sexually harassing them. Um, so violence absolutely does occur in relation to street harassment. Street harassment incidents have, many, have escalated into violent behaviors. The other thing that street harassers do is they, they inspire in their targets and also in their target groups. Fear, self-objectification, avoidance, so women will, women and other targets, will avoid certain areas of the city or the community. They will avoid going out during certain times of the day or night. They will avoid going to certain uh, hot spots. That's definitely something that um, participants in my study talked about. They will avoid going out unless they have somebody with them. They will avoid certain ways to work, like instead of riding the bus, they'll take a cab. Um, all sorts of avoidance behaviors. They disengage with communities, with their own community because it requires so much emotional and other kinds of labor to navigate through street harassment incidents. So they disengage. And of course, they experience anger, depression, and anxiety. What we find is that the psychological and social consequences don't, they look very similar to the kinds of psychological and social consequences that we see with people who are targets, uh, who are experiencing trauma, who've experienced trauma. So one of my respondents um, during our interview described it this way. She said, it's really traumatizing for me to be walking on the street and have someone yell at me or be like getting off the bus. Like recently, it was late at night. I was getting off the bus looking fierce, like my short shorts and my heels. That's what I love. I'm the only one on the bus except for a group of dudes in the back. And they're like, damn, girl, hey, girl. And then I get off. And then they get off right at this corner and start walking toward me. So, like I was already feeling scared when they were just yelling, feeling unsafe, then they get off the bus and start walking toward me, and I'm like, what the bleep is this gonna turn into? So I want you to think about this for just a moment. What do you think she's afraid of? How? Physically raped. She's afraid of rape. So once I started researching street harassment and hearing some of these stories, I knew I needed to look also at fear of crime. And when we talk about fear of crime, for women in all of the research, that translates to fear of rape. But when you're a woman of color, 
the kind of harassment you experience is slightly different. It's racialized. So they will use racial terms. They will rely on racial stereotypes to target women. Elsa, a 28-year-old uh, Asian-American woman that I interviewed, said, I'll be called like a China doll. People will just come up to me, and this is less of a sexualized element, but just come up to me and say really random things in either Chinese or Japanese. They'll be like, oh, konnichiwa, which is like more racist than sexist, but I'm sure they wouldn't go up to a man and do that. So even though it's not sexualized, it's still sexist, if that makes sense. Like sometimes, you know, I've been called a geisha before, although just like in passing, not like expecting to have sex. So yeah, things like that happen all the time. This is an example of the kind of racist street harassment that occurs toward women of color all the time. It's rarely without this element. Darcy describes it this way. There was a lot of catcalling that would use race. Darcy is a multiracial individual. So calling me things like Oreo and calling me things like, to describe my skin color, they would call me honey or brown sugar, things like that. So you can see that even when it's not vicious, it's still calling upon racial stereotypes and it's still quite racist and racialized. So given this, how do street harassment targets respond to harassment. Again, we can't really understand that without knowing, thinking about the link between street harassment, fear of crime, and fear of rape. So, what we know from the literature is that women who fear rape, uh, first of all, almost all women report fearing rape, period. At some point in their lives, it's 100% in almost every sample. Secondly, they don't fear rape from the most likely Scenario, they're not fearing rape from somebody they know, which is by far the greater risk. What they're fearing is rape from the stranger, from somebody who's gonna jump out from behind a building or grab them and drag them down an alley. That's what they fear. A stranger who approaches them who shouldn't approach them, which looks very much like street harassment. So women's responses to street harassment are very informed by this almost universal fear of rape. And that's important to understand. And what rape means is significant. And one of the, the individuals that I interviewed articulated this very well. Althea said, rape is a way to demean that gender aspect, whether we can associate it to, women, to a woman or to men, queer men who we find more effeminate, Rape becomes this kind of weapon against, I don't like to use the word femininity, but rape becomes the weapon against things we deem as women. People we code as women. Yeah. Rape is one way of maybe putting a woman back at her place or making certain that she understands that she can never assert the kind of maleness, that masculinity, and that in fact she is still, will always be a woman and will be in that position to maleness. Right. This is a very um, beautifully phrased way of explaining the symbolism and the power of rape. Rape isn't just an individual act. Rape is an act that terrorizes all women. The fear of rape terrorizes all women to greater and lesser degrees depending upon what they're experiencing in that moment. And it is an exercise that demonstrates the dominance of masculinities and the subjugation of femininities, which is one of the reasons that we see that targets of rape and targets of street harassment are often characterized by femininities. They're often women, or they're persons who are not maybe as necessarily identifying as women, but deemed by the, the harasser as in some ways feminine, including men who the harasser believes have failed to do masculinity properly. This is important because this means the system of doing gender, the system of masculinities and femininities and their relationship to each other should be looked at critically. And I would argue dismantled, remade in much better ways. So some of the responses women have are shaped by the, by the idea that they're going to need to 
protect themselves from rape. So their response to street harassment is very much shaped like, like they're being threatened with rape. How many women in this room have know how to carry their keys to use them as a weapon? Take a look around. That's a lot of people. Did you check out a, a book in the library when you were like five that gave you that lesson? No? Was it taught in your seventh grade class? No. It's a cultural message translated from one generation to the next, right? Because this is an ongoing problem. When we see something that has lasted from one generation to the next, we know that it's become entrenched in our society. The other thing that we see in the response to street harassment is a concept that I call the insight invite dilemma. So what that is, is that women, when they are approached, are not too sure how to respond because what they want to do is communicate to the harasser that they do not want that attention. But they're afraid that if they're too aggressive or too assertive in communicating that, so for instance, if they say, go away, or bleep you, or step off, that the harasser may become violent. So they're afraid of inciting the violence. But they're afraid if they ignore it, then they haven't communicated to the harasser that it's not welcome, that they object to it, and the harasser will continue. They're afraid, furthermore, if they act like it doesn't bother them, like smile and nod. When, some women have described to me that they have thanked the harasser. Oh, thank you. When they, well, even when the harasser has said something uh, profoundly foul. Thank you. And they just keep walking. Because they're trying not to incite violence, but they're also trying not to invite sexual attention. Just want to get through that moment. The incite, invite dilemma describes how women feel like it really doesn't matter which way they go, they're probably not going to be successful in avoiding either continued harassment or potential violence. That fear that shapes that interaction. Um, so Jacqueline describes this very well. She says, I try not to get too testy so that I don't get a violent reaction. And Jacqueline was talking in this instance about being cars that slow down. Uh, cars with more than one man in them, man in them. And, and the men are harassing her. And she said, and I say clearly that I am not interested. Then they will just traipse along in their car, just following me, continuing to talk to me. So I find myself a lot of times, and it makes me angry feeling that I have to be nicer than I'd like to be. I really want to say, ha ha, asshole. But if that could make someone pull out a gun or get out and grab me, then I don't want to do that. So I find that I'm constantly having to, in some ways, self-censor or temper myself, even though I'm the one that's doing nothing wrong. This describes very well what I heard from uh, participant after participant after participant. What I've heard from people who are describing their street harassment experiences and how they want to respond. So the insight invite dilemma is a component of this response system. Another interesting finding is that the self-defense response was present in the research. However, when I look at the self-defense response, what I found is that um, a lot of the responses were sort of, uh, well, they were delivered by white women. And I had to go back and look at the data. I was like, where are the women of color in this? Trinity is a great example of the kind of response I got about self-defense. Trinity had just been talking about how, if at risk, she feels that she could lift a car off a human being. That's what she said. She said, I think, I just can't lose, you know? If it came to that, I don't feel like I could, I, you know, I would just see red and I would go. Like if I was protecting myself for the ones that I love, like, I mean, I would feel that I just wouldn't be able to stop, you know? And I said, like those people who can lift cars? And she said, oh yeah, totally, yeah. Now that's just like super, superhero stuff, right? That's awesome. So great. You can do that. That's awesome. She certainly feels empowered by that, right? But what did I hear from the women of color? Crickets is what I heard. So I had to go back and look again. Absolutely nothing. Nothing about self-defense. What I did hear was them talking about notable and high-profile cases of racial injustice where persons who had fought back had either been killed or arrested. 
such as Sakia Gunn, murdered. The New Jersey Seven, arrested. They talked about these cases. All of the women of color, no matter their racial background. And they said things like this. That to me, that's the kind of violence I'm afraid of. It's the institutional violence. And they said, there are very few consequences for people who assault black women. This was profoundly sad and disturbing, and certainly it should serve as a call to action. So what do we do? And how are social movements, communities, and organizations addressing street harassment? Well, they're raising awareness. There are a lot of campaigns taking place around the topic of street harassment. There's an anti-street harassment week every year, and there's action across the globe during that week. On this campus, students have talked about street harassment in participation with that. There, uh, the, there are organizations such as Hollaback and Stop Street Harassment who are collecting the stories of women's experiences. And some of these serve as educational tools for those who want to avoid certain areas, like, hey, don't go to this intersection, total harasser there today. So some of these things are functioning in that way. And there's a lot of local action, small grants, small research, small groups of people. The example I have here is from Rogers Park in Chicago, Jasmine, and uh, a group of um, activists and community members got together because they were finding that some of their female students were not going to school because of the harassment they experienced on the walk to school. They said, we have got to do something about this. The other thing they're doing is they're asking for changes uh, they're asking for this to be addressed in policy and practice in local communities. They're targeting companies and governments. So for instance, this sign here, if it's unwanted, it's harassment, uh, was hanging in the um, uh, Chicago Transit Authority. It's a Chicago Transit Authority sign. And they're also trying to address some of the underlying causes. So for instance, homophobia and transphobia uh, contribute, obviously, to street harassment. So there, DC has got a campaign showing the community that, hey, we appreciate and value our transgender citizens, and you should too, trying to help people move past their hatred. Another thing that we see, and this is really important, it's, it's maybe the most important thing to me as an activist in this uh, work, is recognition of the overlapping issues. So online harassment is a huge issue, and online space is public space. If women aren't free to share their thoughts, their opinions, their scholarly work, if they're not free to do that without a troll commenting, then we have a problem. But what's really interesting is that the way in which trolls comment toward women versus men is profoundly violent and sexualized. So when a male person posts something and a male reader responds to it in disagreement, they may attack the argument, but they don't say, I'm coming to your house to rape you. And that is exactly what we're seeing in spaces online. It's so bad that the UN has recently decided this matters to them too. And the UN is also actively involved in addressing street harassment. Because women's safety in public space is imperative to our belonging and participating in a free democracy. Everyone should be able to walk down the street safely. Public space should be safe space. And then the other thing that we can all do is, like, stop policing gender. It's, it's not your business and it doesn't matter. You shouldn't be telling each other to man up or that you're not man enough or that you're... It's slut shaming is a type of gender policing because a good woman, a real woman, a woman who's observing the norms of her gender would not be having whatever activity one might have if they are called that, right? So we need to stop policing gender. We need to think about how we are responding to each other, both those that we know and those we don't know. We need to imagine that uh, the dress code in schools should not argue that a, a girl's shoulder could distract the boy. This is gender policing. 
We need to not flip out when same-sex couples uh, get married or have babies. This is a, a wedding announcement for a lesbian couple here. I'm pregnant, says one t-shirt, and the other one says, I'm not the father. I find that amusing. We need to not shame men who display feminine behaviors or behaviors that we code as feminine. So for instance, I cringe every single time somebody criticizes a politician who cries. I don't know how you can try to govern in our world and not feel some emotion, and why shouldn't you be entitled to express it? Who does it serve to shut that down? So we can all stop policing gender. It's not a good thing to do. It does more damage than you might imagine. And beyond yourself, it's a ripple. We can be better bystanders. Recently, an incident occurred on a subway in which a transgender individual was targeted for harassment. The individuals there who witnessed it captured it on their phone. We can interrupt things. We can call the police if we don't feel safe interrupting. And if we feel safe, we can say, knock it off. Don't do that. We can go stand by the person who's being targeted. We can show solidarity. And we can understand the ways in which street harassment as an issue and the social movements meant to address it overlap with other issues. All people should be safe in public space. And not just from random street harassers, but from those who represent our government as well. So we should be interested in racial profiling as a street harassment issue. And one of the reasons that I'm involved with Stop Street Harassment is because it recognizes the intersectional links in how we need to address this. Finally, when we're doing our social justice work, and particularly when we're involved with social justice movements, we need to follow the lead of those who are the most marginalized, those who are the most oppressed, and typically, that is women of color. We need to stop and we need to hear. We need to listen and we need to follow. If you have come to help me, said one activist, Lila Watson, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is tied up with mine, then let us work together. And I will end with a quote from Audre Lorde, one of my idols. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. I hope you take this information, try to make the world a better place. Thank you so much for being here.